Let's just pause for a moment in silence. <clears throat> Let your spirit arise. Let the Lord speak to your spirit in silence and rest in his presence. This is a time of refreshing. Love the Lord. Let him embrace you this morning. Hear God giving you comfort, assurance that no matter what you go through here today, our God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Glory to Jesus. I will be with you, and I am with you. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Take this moment. For God to bless you, to minister to you, glorify your name, O oh God. Glorify your name, Lord Jesus. We're gathered in your house, Lord, today. We're giving you, Lord, this time. This is not our time, but this is your time. Lord, this is, not, this is not about us, but it's all about you this morning, dear God. So, Lord, help your people to unwind in your presence. Lord, help us to train ourselves to live behind. Or if we need, Lord, help us to bring this to your feet. Leave it there and to trust you, Lord, to do what you need to do in our lives. So Lord, thank you in the name of Jesus, the Holy Spirit, Lord, moving in the midst of us today will continue his work not only in this Sunday service, but throughout the day, throughout the week. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful presence and the presence of your people who is worshiping you now. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. You see, worship is one of our purposes, right? We exist to worship God, right? We exist to worship God, amen. And worship is not only confined in like a 30 minutes, a 45 minutes thing like what we did today, but worship is a lifestyle. Worship is a commitment that we give to the Lord because our God is worthy to be worshipped. Amen? From the rising of the sun to the going down of the saints, the Lord's name is to be praised. Amen? Praise God. Good to see you in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Look around and see new faces again and welcome again this morning. Welcome in the house of the Lord. I pray that the message here and the fellowship here and the brethren will really encourage you to serve the Lord, to love the Lord, and to come again. Amen. You know, the church is open, and if there be any need, let us know, and we'll be more than willing to help you and to assist you. But for now, welcome to Holy Ground Family Fellowship of America. God bless everyone. God bless. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. This morning, I'd like to speak on this topic, serving with a willing heart. Serving the Lord with a willing heart. Amen. Now, I will start by saying, God did not only call us to salvation, but God called us to serve Him as well. Amen. God did not only call us to salvation, but God also called us to serve Him. Our salvation leads us to our heavenly destination. Service is what God has called us to do while still on earth. Now, our calling to serve the Lord has two sides. First is what I call service towards the body of Christ that we technically call ministry. 
like our life group ministry, our departmental ministries, or any ministers we do to encourage, build up the body of Christ. We minister to one another together in fellowship, serving one another as unto the Lord, loving one another. That's our ministry to the body of Christ. Today, our worship team has ministered to us. Amen. By leading us into the presence of the Lord and the messages, of, the messages of the song that we hear today inspired us that God is gracious, that we're all under the grace of God. That is ministry to the body of Christ. When you call somebody to pray for them, to encourage them, that is ministry to the body of Christ. That's one side of our calling to serve the Lord. Second is our ministry or our service to the world that we technically call mission. We have a mission. God has commissioned us to go and to preach the gospel. Amen. Yesterday, in our food distribution, I was so blessed to see God's people, those who volunteered, the servants of God who came and served, you know, and fulfilling their mission to the community. I guess almost like a hundred people came, right? Or families came yesterday. Amen. You know, we went to Selma for another ministry. But yesterday, you know, thank God, you know, for those who came and for those who served the people, both young people, adult-like and senior citizens alike, you know, you came, you know, fulfilling to serve the Lord, your mission to the community. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. In fact, some came back, you know, as a result of that, and we welcome you here this morning in the house of the Lord. Now, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 to 12 tells us, okay, Ephesians chapter Chapter 4, verse 11 to 12 says us, So Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. What for? To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Right? So I'd like to point out this morning that the main top priority of the leaders of the church, that are the pastors and the teachers, are to prepare God's people for works of service. Did you hear me, church? Amen. You are equipped, you are being prepared to do services, to do the works of service based from this Ephesians chapter 4, 4 verse 11 to 12. So from now on until the Lord returns, until you're part of this congregation, I want you to conceive, I want you to understand that you will be trained to work for service. Oh, I'm not going back next Sunday anymore. Hallelujah. Amen. I mean, if you're a Christian, a born-again Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, there's no option for you. Amen. No more option for you. You are called for works of service. Can I hear amen? amen. Hallelujah. No option for you. God has a reason. God has a purpose. Why he called you to serve the body of Christ and to serve the world. That is your calling. That is our calling. And, to, and you're being equipped as his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Hallelujah. God's people are called for works of service. That is a statement I'd like to make this morning. God's people are called for works of service. Can I hear amen? Amen. Now, what's the qualification or the age qualification from toddler up? Don't you know that our Sunday school are being used by the Lord to win souls? Amen? Amen? Our Sunday school kids are used by the Lord to bring their parents to church. We brought people from, you know, during our VBS, they came to church because of that as well. Amen. You know, because their kids love it. So from toddlers down to the oldest of one of here, you know, you are qualified to do service for God. Amen. Now, if God has called us to serve him, how come not all are doing the works of service? How come not all are doing the works of service. You know, I personally believe that every born-again Christian who is committed and who loves the Lord has a desire to serve the Lord. Amen. But for some reason that we don't know yet, they disqualified themselves. 
right? They have the desire, I want to serve the Lord, but for some reason, they disqualify themselves in serving the Lord. Now, what do you think are the reasons why some Christians disqualify themselves? In my own personal observation, you know, fear, I guess, even my own experience, is one big reason why many disqualify themselves from serving the Lord. Fear is one major big reason why Christians disqualify themselves from serving the Lord. Now, if I will ask you or anybody here today, men and women, that you'll be assigned to preach next Sunday, I'm sure you'll say, oh, no, 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 I, I can't. I can't preach. I'm scared. I don't, I, public speaking is my cup of tea. Or maybe some of you, finally, they notice my potential. <laughs> but generally, all of you, some of us say, oh, oh no, I'm not ready, Pastor. But not, no, 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 I, I think not ready is and it's an excuse. It's a lame excuse. The reason is because you're scared. You're afraid to speak or to preach or to exhort behind this pulpit. Now, in reality, fear has a limiting effect, right? Fear has a limiting effect. It limits us to enjoy the adventure of life. Our traumatic experiences in life establish fear in our lives that limits us to try again. We used to rent a house with a swimming pool. And one day, Paul decided to teach the three kids how to swim with the with Stephanie and Daniel, no problem with them. So while Joshua was in the shallow part of the swimming pool, was just waiting and playing, for some reason, Paul came and said, Joshua, come on, it's your turn. He said, no, no, no. But he took him anyways and forced him and dropped him in the deep water, in the deep part of the, of the swimming pool. Boy, I saw Joshua just went panic, and he was so scared, I jumped into the water. Of course, he was there, you know, and he's strong enough to carry him. But yet, that became a traumatic experience, established fear in his heart even right now. And he never tried again. So that fear limits him to try again. Now when we go to a simple, he will always ask me, Dad, is there a small part? Is there a small? He said, no small, I'm not swimming, I'm not swimming. No, there's small. There's, I mean, he means the shallow part. We went one time in a retreat with the church board, you know, and there was no small part there. So he never did because there was no... See, fear limits us, stops us to try again, right? Now, fear also not only has a limiting effect, or, yeah, but also has, has a stopping effect in our lives. It stops you to release your potential and to be what God intends you to be. People know, your loved one knows, and I know your pastor, that you can do it. But your fear is so loud, you can't hear them, and you hear your fear saying, you cannot do it. You can't do it. Hence, she lost the courage to explore. Remember that courage is not the absence of fear, right? But courage is really doing what you need to do in spite of your fear. Right? Courage is doing what you need to do in spite of your fear. Now, last Monday, Fred and Suzette said, Uncle, let's go to Sequoia National Park. Oh, well, that's a good idea. Okay, let's try. Let's go, you know. I have no idea the way to Sequoia National Park. Have you been there? And I have fear of heights. And I don't like driving at all. For some reason, we, we got lost. We were just making a loop, loop around, you know, in the plain area. And the, finally, we found a place, you know, we had to look to Squaw Valley and there. And right after Squaw Valley, are we going up? In my mind, are we going up? Are we going to that mountain right there? My fear started to grip me. I became so tensed, so quiet, especially when I was up there. I, I would not look. I was so dry, I was driving so slow, I looked in the mirror, I guess several cars were following us. Because I was driving so slow, I said, I don't care. I'll drive in. And the rest of the game, hey, look, take picture, take, oh, beautiful, 
you. And beautiful view. What do you mean beautiful view? It was just oh, was so tense, really. I was so tense. But anyways, I took care of it so because I must do it. In spite of my fear, I, 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 I drove, I, drove, I just said, so I'm behind you guys, but I saw behind you, I, I, I don't like this driving here anyway. And I'm, I haven't reached my destination yet, I'm thinking also about driving back. <laughs> to make the story short, I made it. But it took courage for me to do it as well. And now let's say, you see it, you can do it, I just keep quiet. So, see, it limits us, right? It, it stops us to do something right. Amen, you know? Now, I know of someone back home who retired from work from almost 40 years in the same position he started on day one. He did not accept any promotion nor aim for promotion. Why? Because he was so scared of bigger responsibility in the company. You see, it stops us to do more. You know, he was qualified, I know, but he disqualified himself because of fear of bigger responsibility. Now, there are Bible characters we know, of course, that uh, because of fear, tried to disqualify themselves as well. And what in mind right now is Moses, right? Moses was born to be the deliverer of, of Israel from the bandits in Egypt. Right? In fact, God saved him from birth when Pharaoh ordered midwives to kill newborn babies that are boys. Every male born in the Israelite families kill it, or kill them right away. So to make the story short, you know, baby Moses was saved. He was brought to the Nile River, and Pharaoh's daughter found him in a basket and took him, you know, and nursed him and asked the mother without her knowledge, you know, uh, the mother came and really nurtured and took care of Moses, and he grew up in the palace. And in his adult life, one day he went to check in the field or, in, you know, in Egypt there, and he saw a Hebrew slave, you know, being persecuted or being abused by an Egyptian soldier. So he killed the Egyptian soldier, Egyptian soldier to save the Hebrew one. But the next day, it was discovered. And when, when Pharaoh heard about it, he tried to kill Moses. And Moses fled and lived in Midian. And from then on, he became a shepherd. Then one day in a burning bush experience, you know, God called him and said, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh and deliver my people. The mention of the word Pharaoh, his memory went back to that event in Egypt that caused him to run away. And right away, Moses made excuses. Five excuses. One is in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. Exodus chapter 3, verse 11 said, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring this rest out of Egypt? Who am I? said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now Moses, out of fear, belittles himself. This is not to me, this is not humility, but rather false humility. Who am I? I'm just a nobody. I, I, I mean, nobody noticed me in church. I'm just a Sunday worshiper. I mean, I, I'm not qualified to be part of that team or whatever you know, you're calling me to do, you know. So Moses belittled himself, but actually saying, I am not qualified. I am nobody. I can't lead the million of Israelites out of Egypt. Pharaoh is there. I'm not qualified. I don't have the ability to lead these people. A church fear can make you disqualify yourself for God's service. But God answered, I will be with you. Hallelujah. Amen. God said, I will be with you. You know what, church? It is not who you are that matters. It's all about God being with you and His presence dispels all fears. Amen. It's not about you or who you are. It's all about His being with us and His presence dispels all 
fears. In Exodus 3, 13, also, you know, on that excuse of Moses, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? Moses used his lack of knowledge as an excuse to disqualify himself. Right? Or oh, many times, this could be a common excuse of many Christians when they feel the call of God. I'm not qualified because I lack knowledge. I don't know what to find it in the Bible. Then study the Bible. Right? I don't know how to answer questions. Then, on the job training, you will learn how to answer questions. There are many ways, you know, church. But Moses disqualified himself because he said, What if they ask me? And I don't know how to answer them. Then God answered, I am who I am. Hallelujah. Amen. Again, church, it's not about how knowledgeable you are, that you are qualified. It's all about who sent you. Amen. It is about who sent you. And God said to Moses, tell the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Hallelujah. Bring the name of God in your service and you'll have that authority. Amen. I am who has sent you. Glory to Jesus. But then Moses wasn't satisfied. Still fear controls his mind and his heart. And so in Exodus chapter 4 verse 3, another excuse. And Moses answered God, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? Wow. What if they will question me and will not believe me and say, God did not appear to you? Here, Moses, out of his fear, thought that his lack of authority could disqualify him. Lack of authority. I have not been to Bible school training. I have not been to a seminary. I have not been trained. I don't have the authority. I don't have the title pastor. And people don't really listen to you if you don't have the title reverend or pastor or something before your name in a religious way. But church, God used the stick or staff in Moses' hand to show to the Israelites that he appeared to him. It's not about your authority, but God's authority upon you. Amen. Take the badge of the policeman, his ordinary. Take his uniform and the badge. He is ordinary like us. Civilian, they say. Once they put on the, the police uniform and the bus and all the paraphernalias, wow, a man of authority. And we're afraid, right? We're scared. Same thing with us. John 1, 12 says, But as many as receive him, to them give authority to become children of God. Church, you have that authority right now. Amen. You have that authority right now. But yet still Moses wasn't satisfied after all the answers of God. And yet he said in Exodus 14, Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. Now Mo Moses here again uses his lack of ability to disqualify himself. I'm not a good speaker. People will not listen to me. If you will study church history, not in the biblical times, but in our times, you will see that there were speakers and preachers who are not very eloquent, but yet God mightily used them. A blessed for those who speak well and preach as well, you know, Wow, thank God for those skills. God is good to them. Amen. Hallelujah. But it's not the only qualification to be used of God. Right? Right? So Moses' lack of, of, of ability disqualified himself. But God answered him, I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Wonderful. I will help you and speak. I will help you speak and teach you what to say. Again, it is not about your ability that qualifies you, but your availability followed by God giving you the ability. When you are available, God will supply the ability, church. Amen. 
Hallelujah. You can see that. You can experience that as well. So it's not your ability, but it's your availability, as they say, followed by God's giving you the ability. And finally, in Exodus chapter 4, 13, here comes Moses' final excuse. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. He was at the end of his robe. He can find any more excuse. And so I said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. This is the bottom line. This is the corner. No more way to go. This is a revelation of what is in the heart of Moses. Moses was really out of fear and willing to go. Hello. Moses, really, from his confession, though he did not say, I'm not willing, Lord, but you can tell, you can say that this is a revelation of his, what is in his heart. He was really unwilling to go because he was afraid. Now, there are millions of alibis and excuses for a person who is unwilling. Oh, there's a lion in the field. Right? Go get something. You know. Oh, it's so dark. I'm alone. I'm scared. And this time, God's anger burned against Moses and told him that his brother Aaron will speak for him. Wow. Still no excuse. I guess nobody can run away from the call of God. Right? In my opinion, all these excuses that Moses had was really because of fear that made him unwilling to serve the Lord. It was after God told him that all those who intend to kill him were dead that Moses stood up and went anyway. After he knew that those who want to kill him were dead, okay, I'll go. Hallelujah. Now, why God did not give up on Moses in spite of his unwillingness? Did you, did you, did you know? If, if, if I was God, one excuse is enough. Okay, disqualified. But here, in spite of this series of excuses, God did not give up on Moses. Are you happy that God is not giving up on us? Amen. That God is not giving up on you? Hallelujah! Amen! Why? Because God knew Moses. God knew that Moses had the passion and the potential. God knew that with his anointing, with his power, and with his help, Moses could make it. God had his hand upon Moses from the beginning. He had a plan for Moses to be the deliverer of Israel. And no one, not even Moses' fear, can change the plan of God. Amen, church. Hallelujah, no situation, no circumstances, no weakness, nothing, no need at all that you go through can ever thwart or change God's plan in your life. And I believe that with all my heart, church. God called you because he qualified you. Did you hear me? God called you because he qualified you. There's nothing in us that qualifies us naturally to serve the Lord. It's only by his grace, his amazing grace, that grace beyond our comprehension that qualifies us, that God gave us the call to serve him too. Give him glory, church. Give him glory, church. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, Joshua is the opposite of Moses. Joshua is the opposite of Moses. Now, Joshua is the, is the disciple of, or the second in hand, second in command of Moses. But he was opposite when it comes to responding to the call of God. When God told Joshua after the death of Moses to lead his people to the promised land, there was no record of his excuses. You read in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1 to 9, the call of God to, to Joshua. Right away in verse 10, Joshua stood up, commanded all the people to get ready. We're moving out. Woo! 
Amen. God told Moses, I'm a Joseph. Now my servant is there. Go lead my people to the promised land. I will be with you as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I will give all the land your feet will trod upon. I will prosper you. No one can stand against you. I am with you. Verse 10. And Moses come out of the people. Rise up. Let's go. God told us to go. Then let's go. No excuses. Hallelujah. Do you think he was scared of the great responsibility God gave him? I believe he was afraid. I believe he was scared. That is why God said, be strong and be very courageous. Why? Because God knew, church, that it wouldn't be easy. Leading this hard-headed, stiff-necked people is not easy. Leading three hard-headed kids is not easy. Thousands more, you go about early. It's not easy to lead this you know, to the promised land. Joshua and the Israelites will meet enemies stronger than them. Joshua was under the leadership of Moses. He saw how God mightily used him until God took him. Maybe if he compared himself with Moses, he was below par, and that's enough reason to disqualify himself. Joshua also witnessed the rebellion and the disobedience of the Israelites. That, that's enough to discourage him to step up in leadership. But I believe the major difference between Joshua and Moses was Joshua was willing to serve the Lord. Are you with me, church? The major difference, I think the only difference I see there was that Joshua was willing to serve the Lord. And his willingness was based from his positive experience in the past, unlike Moses. <laughs> Moses, when God called him, hey, Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. I want to go back to Egypt to bring my people out. Egypt? Pharaoh? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Lord, I'm not eloquent. Lord, I'm not qualified. Lord, I don't have the ability. But then when God said to Joshua, Joshua, arise, my servant Moses is dead. Now I want you to lead my people to the promised land. I will be with you as I was with Moses, so I will be with you right away. Joshua said, let's go. Amen. Amen. Amen, church. The Bible says Joshua had another spirit. He witnessed the mighty works of God through Moses. He saw the amazing miracles of God. And when the time came for him to take the lead, he was inspired and willing. He was one of those who say, finally, my time has come. Praise God. Finally, my day and my time has come. It was enough for him to step out in faith after hearing God said, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Isn't that enough for you, church? Isn't that enough for us, church? To willingly serve the Lord, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Amen. Glory to Jesus. May we have the willing spirit to serve the Lord like Joshua. Remember what the Lord has done for your life, saving you, provided, and still providing your needs, giving you food when you need it. Now, talking about willingness, in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, when David turned over the kingship to his son Solomon, this is what he said. And you, Solomon, and you, my son Solomon, Acknowledge the, the God of your father and serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing heart. Amen? Serve him with wholehearted devotion and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches every heart and understands every motive behind the thoughts. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will reject you forever. So the point here is, Solomon, you are now the king. Serve God with a willing mind. Are you with me, church? 
Serve God with a willing mind. God has chosen you. Therefore, rise up. You will build the house of God for His glory and serve Him with a willing mind. Glory to God. Isaiah 119 tells us, Isaiah 119 also tells us, Isaiah 1, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. Church, that is the word of God. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. Not the leftover, not the crumbs, not the someone else left over, but you will eat the best of the land if you're willing and obedient to the call of God in your life. Woo, hallelujah. When can you receive the call of God? Maybe right now you have the call of young people, you have the call of God. Every one of us here this morning, a follower, believer of God, has a call from God. If you're willing and obedient, you will eat the best of the land. Praise God. First Peter chapter 5, verse 2. First Peter 5, 2 tells us, Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Now, this is about the servants of the Lord. But my point here today is, Serve God not because you must, because, but because you're willing and that God wants you to be. Are you with me, church? Are you there, church? Not because you must, but because you're willing. And that is what God wants you to be. Amen. Yes? You are there, you must, because you are there, because you must. You tend to grumble. You tend to count times. You, you tend to see, oh, he's not working. I'm the only one working here. How come he is getting more appreciation than me? Or you, you, if you must, you, you count. You take note of, of the mistakes and the imperfections or whatever it is there. But if you're willing, you don't care. I'll do it anyway. He's not willing, I'll take over. Hallelujah. Amen. That is because you are willing to serve the Lord. Amen, church. 2 Corinthians 8.12. Here it is. For if the willingness is there, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. See? Anything you bring to the Lord, either a service or a gift or whatever it is that you offer to the Lord, if, if willingness is there, did you hear me, church? If willingness is there, it is acceptable to God. Hello? Hello? No, this is in the context of giving. You know, God do not require, as the Bible says in some translation here, God doesn't ask you to give what you don't have. But whatever you have when you give, it must come from a willing heart. Then it's only then that it's acceptable to God. Are you with me? When you give your, your, your love offering, when you give your time, oh, I must give it. There's no other way, but I must give. No. Church, that is not acceptable, but I'm willing to give because I understand the principle. I understand this is the word of the Lord. This is what God desires from me. You know, and if willingness is there, you will reap the harvest of your giving. Amen, church. Hallelujah. Another reason why some disqualify themselves from serving the Lord is weaknesses. Weaknesses. Our human weakness that makes us feel unworthy, I believe, is one of the reasons why many Christians disqualify themselves to serve the Lord. Right? Oh, this weakness. I'm not qualified. What if they discover this weakness? Oh my gosh, I'm not worthy. I, I, I'm not serving God. 
I'll wait until I feel worthy. No, you will never, you can never wait until you feel worthy because from the start we are unworthy. We are worthy because God made us worthy. Amen. Right. This is our human glitch, so to speak, makes us feel disqualified to serve the Lord. Right? This human glitch, we have this human defect, this malfunction in us, church. Sometimes it makes us feel so unworthy to serve the Lord. But again, we find Bible characters with glitch in their lives, but God mightily used them in advancing the kingdom of God. Rahab is one. She was a prostitute. She has a weakness for men, but yet she turned to the Lord in faith, and God turned her weakness to strength to the point that down the line, he became one of, one of a member of the family tree of Jesus Christ, the lineage of Christ. Jacob, which means deceiver, he loves to deceive. He loves to, uh, to, to uh, as a planter. But later on became Israel and became the nation of Israel. The 12 disciples had their own glitch in life, you know, or defects. Yet Jesus chose them and they became mighty after they turned to the Lord in prayer. Now just listen to this. If you keep on focusing on your weakness, then you will, you will miss to see your strength. Do you hear me? If you keep on focusing on your weakness, then you will never see your strength. Right? If you keep on finding what is missing, you will never find what you have. Hello? Did you hear me? Did you hear me? Amen. Oh, I can't serve the Lord. I have this weakness. Well, yeah, that's true. Who else would have? Who else would have a weakness among us here? Right. But if we focus always on our weakness, on the glitch in our lives, you know, that we will never see that we have the strength God gave us, that if only we turn this weakness of the Lord in prayer, in the spirit of humility, He can turn this weakness into our strength and experience what Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong, because His strength is made perfect in my weakness. Amen, church. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. Because of our fallen nature, we have glitch. But if we offer to God our glitch, then we will experience what Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong, for his strength is made perfect in my weakness. In fact, church, I want you to know out here, there is benefit when we recognize our weakness because it can lead us to totally depend upon God. You know, public speaking is not my cup of tea. No. When God, I thought, when I responded to the call of God to be a pastor, just to serve the church, like as a Christian, like assistant to the priest, bring whatever, or wipe the, 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 the sweat, or clean the altar, or help, help clean the church. So I thought that's, but you know, but when I, was, I went through seminary, there's hermeneutics. We have to learn how to, sp how to preach, to study, and to make a sermon. Oh boy, I said, it's going to be preaching. And every day, every, every week, you have to preach. Every week, you have to preach. Every day, you have Bible study. You stand before people. I sweat. But yet, I said, Lord, help me. Amen. I'm giving this weakness to you. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm not an eloquent speaker per se, you know, when on the spot. No, I need to prepare. Because that's public speaking in my weakness. I have butterflies in my stomach. In fact, to be honest, I was invited to speak at Selma yesterday. And that was three months ago. Every week I think I'll be speaking to strangers. I'll be speaking to whose people that I don't know. Oh my gosh, what will I say? Lord, help me, help me. And then a week before, I thought of Eddie Mesa. Oh, yeah, that's right. I checked if he is open on that date yesterday. Thank God he was open. So I called my cousin, would you like Eddie to come instead of me speaking? Oh, sure, sure, sure. So he did yesterday. I was free. <laughs> Boy, I was free. And then when they gave Eddie Mesa a blessing, oh, I missed it. <laughs> That's true. Those who are willing, obedient, they will eat the best of the land. 
So me, I just started giving the offering, you know, an envelope said, how much? <laughs> Hello? Because I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm happy to speak here because you're so familiar to me, but bring me to some other chairs. I tell you, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord, anointing, Lord. Because this is not my, 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 let me clear the chairs. I'll do it from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same with a willing heart. You know what I mean? Or do anything outside, here inside the chairs, but not so much here. I'm here because I need to be here. Hallelujah. See, our weakness can be, can, can be, you know, God can turn a weakness, you know, as we submit and give it to Him. Amen? Actually, in reality, our weakness has its own purpose in serving God. It keeps us from becoming proud or conceited. To keep Paul from becoming proud or conceited because of the excessive revelations from God, God allowed a recurring problem to torment him to keep him from being conceited. In fact, yesterday at the fellowship, in Selma, I was praying, Lord, don't, 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 don't let them ask me to pray for the food, Lord. I'm honest to goodness. I'm not joking here. Really, I was trying to be in the corner that nobody was seeing because there are other pastors there, other who are able to pray there, you know. I was just hiding as if going away, you know. I said, Lord, don't, don't, don't make them ask me to pray. There, there's Pastor June, there's Pastor Mark, there's Pastor somebody. No, 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 I mean. And here comes my cousin, Ed, you pray for the food. <laughs> and I said, Lord, help me. I went to the bathroom, came back. Okay, let's pray. I was just, I, I'm, not, I'm not really, to be honest with you, I, even to pray for food in the public, I, I could hardly speak. That's me, honestly speaking. But when God called us to serve Him, He knew all the way who we are, our weakness, our strength, but yet in spite of His complete and perfect knowledge of who we are, still He is saying, I have qualified you. Amen? I have qualified you. I called you. I empowered you. I will equip you. And my grace is sufficient for you as I was with Moses. So I will be with you. I think that's enough. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Joshua was mightily used of God, church, but yet without a weakness. There was a time because of his imperfect faith, he sent spies to Jericho even though God ensured him a victory, right? God spoke to him, I will give you Jericho. But yet, because of his lack of faith, that is his weakness, he sent spies. Are they big enough? Are they strong enough? Can we make it? Can we conquer them? When God said, you can. And secondly, you know, he was overconfident. After destroying Jericho, the next in line is Ei, and he spent sent spy again, and the spy came back. Oh, they're too small. Don't send more troops. You can just just send three thousand soldiers, and we can handle them quickly. Chicken, it's easy. And so just okay, okay, no sweat. Send three thousand only, and they came back defeated with thirty-six death. Overconfident. That's a weakness, and God you know, taught him a lesson. But God used Moses and Joshua despite their weaknesses. The primary lesson to draw from Joshua's life and that of Moses is that God is faithful to his promises. God promised Abraham that his descendants would dwell in the land. And under Joshua, God brought the people into the land that he had promised to give to them. This act completed the mission of redemption that God started with Moses in bringing Israel out of Egypt. It also a type which points to the ultimate redemption that Jesus brings to the community of faith. Like Moses, Jesus delivered us from the bandage and slavery of sin. And like Joshua, Jesus will bring us into the eternal promised land and everlasting Sabbath rest. Amen? Therefore, for now, all what God needs from you is a willing heart, a surrendered heart, a heart that follows hard after Him. Amen? A willing heart 
and serving the Lord. Amen. That And you can witness, you can pray for the sick, you can counsel, you can pray, you can serve the body of Christ, and you can do mission work because you are qualified. Tell somebody, you are qualified. Come on, church. You are qualified. And now declare it and say it, I am qualified. Amen? I am qualified. Say it, church. I am qualified. Woo! Hallelujah. All of you are qualified to pray. All of you here are qualified to witness. All of you here are qualified to be a leader. All of you are qualified to stand in the pulpit here to say a prayer or, or, or share the word of God. All of you are qualified to be volunteers. All of you are qualified to be servants of God. Amen. All of you are qualified to be worshipers. Hallelujah. God has qualified you. Amen. How, there's nothing in you that qualifies you naturally into a service, but by His grace, He qualified me, He qualified you, He qualified all of us, and so we can declare, I am qualified. Don't let the devil inject fear that limits you, that stops you. Don't let your weakness stop you from saying, yes, Lord, I'm willing to serve you. Here am I, oh God, send me. Here am I, oh Lord, send me. Hallelujah. When every single person seated here today have just like Joseph willing, this church will grow more and more and more for his glory and for his honor. Stand with us, please. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, blessed be the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, give us a willing heart. Don't let fear come in, the, in between our call, O oh Lord. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Yes, we have all weaknesses. Father God, but we say like St. Paul, when I am weak, then I am strong because your strength is made perfect in my weakness. It is when we surrender our weakness. Yes, Lord, it's true that our weakness can be a hindrance to serve you. But if in humility, oh God, and surrender our weakness to you, you can turn our weakness to strength and we can serve you. We can serve the body of Christ. We can serve our community. We can serve the world because that is our calling in this life. So Lord, today speak to the hearts of your people. Give them, Lord, a willing heart to follow hard after you. Give them, Lord, a surrendered heart this morning, knowing that it is your grace. Hallelujah. Only your grace, oh God, can enable us. Your anointing. You have empowered us, oh God. You have qualified us. We have no right to excuse ourselves from serving you like Moses, oh God, because we can actually never run away from your call. But Lord, give us a willing and a beating heart so that we will eat the best in the land. Thank you, Jesus.